Hi and welcome, my name is Julianne Cost, and in the next few minutes we're going to take a look at some of the hidden gems in Photoshop CC. Now I want to start with the ability now to place a pattern along a path and we're going to use the scripting engine in order to do that. But first we need to know how to define a pattern. So let me just quickly hide all of the layers here and show you that really you can you can define a pattern in a variety of different ways. I happen to want to put arrows along a path so I use the custom shape tool and for my shape I simply selected this arrow and then clicked and dragged out that shape. Then I used the marquee tool and I clicked and dragged a selection around the shape and then selected edit and define pattern. So it's as easy as that to define the pattern that you're going to then apply to the shape. All right, I don't need that so I'll use command Z and just get rid of that and we'll toggle on the other layers. You'll notice here in my paths panel, I do have a path that's already created. That might be a little difficult to see, so again, I'll toggle those off. If I tap the A key, I can actually select that path. So that's the path we're going to be using. All right, let's toggle back on all of those other layers. Now, in order to apply this pattern to the path, I simply choose Edit and then Fill. And for the contents, I'm going to use Pattern. Once I select that, I have the option for my scripted patterns and I can select Place Along Path. You'll notice here that I have my custom pattern that I just defined, so I'll want to select that arrow and click OK. Now we get to choose how we want that pattern, in this case the arrow, to form along that path. We can change the scale, so if I wanted to, I could bring this down to maybe 50%. I can change the spacing if I want. I can also adjust the spacing to fit. You can see that I can change the angle from the path if I want to. I can also change the distance from the path if I wanted to offset it. And I can alternate the patterns one on either side of the path. I'll go ahead and uncheck that right now and let's put the distance of the path back to zero. I could also skip the symbol rotation. Right now, the arrows you'll notice follow along that path, but I could uncheck that if I just want those arrows to remain in the original orientation as they were when I created or defined that path. If my pattern contains different levels of gray, I can actually vary the color randomness as well as the brightness randomness. But for right now, let's go ahead and just click OK and we can see that I've got my arrows along the path. But I want to make this a little bit more interesting, so I'll use Command Z in order to undo that. This time I'll use the keyboard shortcut Shift Delete in order to bring up the Fill dialog box. I'm going to stay with the arrow, place along path, click OK, but this time I'm going to go in and I'm going to modify the scale progression. I want to change this to somewhere maybe around 95, and I'll skip the symbol rotation. And now you can see what's going to happen is the arrows are going to start off large and then slowly get smaller and smaller as they follow that path. So when I click OK, now we get a result like this. If I click off the path, I think you can see how easy it is now to actually create any type of pattern and have it follow along a path that you've created with the pen tool or with any of the vector tools. Okay, to show the second hidden gem, we're going to move to this image right here. And this also is going to use the new scripted patterns. Now, I've created a blank layer here, and I want to add a tree to this image. I'll use the shortcut Shift-Delete in order to bring up the Fill dialog box. But here, I'll change this to Tree. Once I click OK, you can see we have several different trees that you can choose from, and all of these trees are scripted so that every time you create a new tree, they're always going to be different. So this isn't like using clip art. Once I select a tree, I can actually go in and change the direction of the light. You can see the preview of that right down here. I can also change the camera tilt. I can change the amount of leaves. So if I want just a few leaves on my tree, or maybe I want a completely barren tree, I can select that. Or we can add more leaves. I can also change the color for my leaves. So if I click here in the green color swatch, if I want to make these a little bit more olive color or a little bit more yellow, I can go ahead and select that. And I can choose a custom color for my branches as well. 
In addition, if I was doing more illustrative art, I could choose to actually do flat shading for the leaves as well as flat shading for the branches. But for right now, I'm going to leave it as is and click OK. Now it might take a few seconds to generate this tree, but I think that you'll see that once I do this, this is going to be an incredibly powerful feature for anyone who's working on maybe say architectural renderings where they need to add a variety of different trees in the landscape or anyone who's doing any concept art. Instead of trying to find a tree image using stock images, you can simply create the trees here for that mock-up. Now that we've got the tree, let's go ahead and free transform it. I'm going to use Command T or Control T in order to just make this a little bit smaller and maybe place it over here a little bit. Tap Return or Enter to apply that. I could add a layer mask here if I wanted to. Tap the B key to get my paintbrush. Since I'm painting with black, I can just click right here in order to make the tree look like it's actually going down into the grass. And of course, if I wanted to create a second tree, that second tree would look different from this because again, every time you use this scripted pattern, it's randomizing the branches as well as the leaves. Now, for a photo illustration, this may or may not look realistic enough for what you need, but I'll tell you, I'm going to create a new layer right now. And then I'm going to hold down the Option key when I select Merge Visible, or it would be the Alt key on Windows, in order to create kind of a flattened version of those two layers on this layer one. And I'm going to rename this Painting. And then I'll select Filter and Oil Paint. And we can go ahead and zoom in here, and I can change all of the different settings. I actually don't like the little shine there, so I'm going to take that off. But now we can customize how stylized we want the painting to be. We can change the cleanliness. You can change scale and bristle detail. And when you click OK, you've got a much more interesting painting of a landscape now with a tree to the left-hand side. But I'd also like to add a quick border to this. So I'm going to return one more time to the Fill menu for our scripted patterns. But in order to make this flexible, I'll go ahead and I will add a new layer. We'll just call this Edge. And then I'll use the keyboard shortcut Shift-Delete in order to bring up the Fill dialog box. And we'll change this to Picture Frame. Once I click OK, you'll notice that there are a number of different edges or frames that I can apply to this image. I'm actually going to select one of the very simple ones. It's the crisscross double line box. And you can see that we could change the margin or the offset from the edge. In this case, because I didn't create a selection beforehand, Photoshop is going to create this edge using the entire document size. If I had created a selection, say with a marquee tool, then this margin would be offset from that selection. So we'll just offset it a little bit. We can go ahead and change the size. I'm going to make this a little bit larger. I think as I make it larger, you might be able to see that double frame in there. I'll lower it a bit. And then we can also change the thickness. I actually want this to be quite thin, so I'm going to bring that down. Now we'll go ahead and click OK. And now we can see that we have that edge pattern here. Now in order to make this a little bit more interesting, I'll go ahead and select the Marquee tool. And I'm going to just select that edge area. I'll return back to my painting layer, add a layer mask there. And we'll hide the other layers underneath so you can see that it's masking to white now. And then I'll use my Properties panel and just give it a little bit of a feather to kind of soften that edge. Now if I go too far, the nice thing about this feather slider is that it's non-destructive. We can always pull that back. But now I've got this nice edge to my image. And of course, I can add multiple edges if I want to. We could add another new layer, and we'll call this Edge 2. And we can go back into the Picture Frame Scripted Patterns by using Shift-Delete to bring up the Fill dialog box. This time I will choose something a little bit more ornate. In this case, let's use this Happy Vine. And we can change the margin to maybe about 10. Let's go ahead and decrease the size down. Maybe we'll increase the thickness a bit. You'll notice we can also change the angle. We can change the arrangement. I mean, this is a really, really flexible script for making borders. I forgot to point out as well that we can click up here. This is our color swatch. So if I wanted to change the color, I can do that. And then I can choose, in this case, because of this happy vine here, 
I can choose a small flower. So we've got a number of different items we can select from. We could do a snowflake, we could do the sun, whatever you prefer. In this case, I will select this small flower. And again, you have a color swatch here that you could change the color, make it maybe a little bit of a rose color and then click OK. Now, I think it's a little bit too ornate for an image like this, but my point is, is that you can go in and for each one of those different picture frames, you can modify all of the different variables. And when you do that, don't forget, you're not limited to just one of those frames. You can come back in and create multiple frames with multiple different options. Okay, so for now, we'll turn that off and take a look at a few of the other hidden gems. The first one you probably uh, would never notice, but if I use the keyboard shortcut command in to bring up the new dialog box, this area here for background contents, if you select other or if you click in this color swatch right here and you choose a different color for your default background contents, that is actually scriptable now. So if you're writing an action, it will go ahead and keep that background contents color. And if you create a new preset, it will also keep it there. Then once I've created this new document, really nice new feature over here in the background layer. If I want to convert this from a background to a layer, all I need to do is just click on the lock icon and it does it for me. All right, let's return back to this other image and let's take a look at the swatches panel. You'll notice that at the top of the swatches panel, I now have a number of different swatches. These are the recently used swatches. So you might have seen these before. For example, if I go to the rectangle tool for my fill, as well as my stroke, you can see we have those same recently used colors. So now it should be really easy to go back and forth to your recently used colors without having to actually save them as different swatches. And even if I move from one file or one document to another, those are going to be persistent. And finally, if I select the color sampler tool, when I add color samples, you used to be limited to just adding four, but you'll notice now in the info palette, I can continue to click and add up to 10 different color samples. Not only that, but if I wanted to change the values here, for example, maybe I wanted the color sampler for readout number one to be in grayscale, I can go ahead and select that, but that only changes this one color sampler. If I hold down the option key and select, say, CMYK, you'll notice that all of the color samplers change at once. So that was option on the Mac. Of course, that would be alt on the PC. And if we want to clear all of the color samplers, it's really easy. We can simply click clear all. You might not think that that is a new option, and in fact, it's not, but there was a little bit left up to interpretation beforehand because it just said clear. People weren't sure if it was going to clear the last one or if indeed it was going to clear all. Excellent. That wraps up the hidden gems in Photoshop CC. My name's Julianne Cost. Thanks for joining me.